seventh event the year. Uh, we do this monthly, every every third Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m. And uh, we've been holding them here, but we, we might move depending on what else happens with the uh, scheduling conflicts throughout the school year. But uh, we've been having them here, so uh, we found it once, so we'll be able to find it again, and it's hard to get here. Uh, for tonight, we have four companies presenting. Our format is, is uh, pretty straightforward, the same every time. Five typically four to five companies present. They get five minutes to demo or present, and five minutes Q&A, interacting with the audience. Um, and we follow it up with open networking. And so uh, any community announcements, um, we're also, uh, we're also uh, inviting at that time as well. Uh, for tonight, we have uh, a very interesting uh, array of companies uh, from Ann Arbor. Um, uh, one recently in Ann Arbor. Um, we have uh, Audiolo, Therapy Charts, Mobiata, and Kurt Motor Company. And um, with that, we'll go and get started. And uh, I'd like to introduce Aaron Nelson from Audiolo. And he'll be talking about uh, their uh, fabulous semiconductor company. Right. So we're, at, we're a fabulous semiconductor company in the analog space. I'm Aaron Nelson, and this is uh, Brian Bigman. So, real quick, what we do is analog audio processing. What is that? That's processing the real world. The real world is waves, it's not ones and zeros, it's logarithmic in nature. So anything that happens in the real world, we process. We do speech, uh, vibrations, uh, changes in air pressure, things like that are very easy to, or to, to process. In analog is very difficult in digital. So that gives us advantages, mostly in power, but, not, but also in effectiveness. Markets that we're looking at right now are hearing aids, noise cancellation, and feature detection. And they're all kind of linked together and they kind of build, have building blocks on top of each other. Real quick, this is fundamentally how, how it works in, say, a hearing aid. Is you take noisy sound, what you're trying to do is highlight the speech, figure out what component of it is the speech and what's noise, eliminate that noise, clean up the signal and pass it on to the user so that they can hear what they want to hear. And the reason we're able to do this in such low power is down below you see a dime, you see a digital or a DSP chip, and then you see our processor, which is the comparative uh, processing power. So we have a lot of, a lot, a lot we can go, uh, or a lot of room to grow in terms of what we can process. And what we're going to do today is give you a brief uh, demonstration of one piece of, of this technology, which is feature detection, or looking through noise to find one particular type of sound. Okay, so. Oh. We're actually going to show you is a, a classifier. Where's a classifier? Basically, if you guys go to a concert, anyone here play an instrument? Probably a lot of people do. Right. 440 is an A, right? But you can listen to a piano, you can listen to a clarinet, you can listen to a tuba, and you know they're all different. That's what, how your brain works. Well, interestingly, that's a very difficult problem for digital processors. So we solved the problem with analog, leveraging some really smart biology against circuits. And so, if you know anything about glass, you know it's a liquid crystal, that means it has a fundamental tone, and so we have a glass brick detector. Why is this useful? Well, it has commercial interest, that's why it's useful. Uh, it comes down to the fact that uh, if you're going to actually rob a place, you're probably going to cut the phone line, and then you'll probably cut the power, and then yeah, and then all the commercial glass brick detection will work. So this was designed actually for a company uh, that uses a, a battery, a glass brick detector, and then a wireless motor. So their problem, well, I'll talk about the problem second, but let's just show, show it working. All right, we're going to do that. Let's talk about this. Okay. So here's their, yeah, here's their problem. Their problem is you have a digital signal processor sitting there running, looking for these sounds. You just kind of burn through a battery in about two days. Well, an analog solution generally is 100 to 1,000 times more power efficient. So if you look at it at the idea of a day, you know, digital or the digital uh, circuit works for a day, well, it will work for 100 days or more. And that's kind of the angle on it. So, that's the need. So actually where this fits in now is the fact that we're doing hearing aids. And because we're doing hearing aids, we're concerned about speech. So we actually have a, can reprogram this to be a speech detector. But we're going to start with glass for now. Anyway, let's, let's show them it. So this is a scope. Now let me tell you how this thing works. So, as the, so how this works in a bigger system is it sits on the front end of a of the system. It basically listens for what thinks is glass breaking, and then it passes all that information to a standard digital signal processor that then determines if it's actually glass. It's a system that's designed to have high false positives, but the whole point is that the DSP, that is a kind of a nice thing because you can change the software, is not grinding the algorithms the whole time, it just does it when you wake it up. So you wake it up, and then it, it looks to determine if it's actually glass. 
So hit two bottles. Oh, sorry. Right. So the top one is what the mic is. The bottom one is currently high. The three there is actually low. The DSP of the Spec4 actually has an active low signal, meaning you hit the thing together, and if it actually sees, thinks there's glass there, the line goes low, wakes up the DSP, and processes the whole, whole sound. So did it try it? So don't break it. It's not. There it is. <laughs> Woo, looks stupid, but that saves you a lot of power. Now, uh, why does this matter? Well, here's, a, here's another example. So my, uh, my, what I specialize is in low power. Um, so my laptop lasts much longer than your laptop. Your laptop probably lasts for four hours. Mine lasts for 22 hours. Right? So power, power actually does not sell unless you have something like this. Uh, by the way, if you ever want to talk about how to do that to your laptop, come find me. No, you to get me. But the whole point is there's a big market here. And this is very good for hearing aids because this helps us make a better hearing aid. I don't know if any of you have ever used hearing aids, but they're pretty terrible. That's the point. So how does this work? Well, we basically look at things the same way the brain looks at things. High energy is a function of energy, high frequency, low frequency, and, uh, well, well, zero crossing is basically the frequency detector. And it's just a big, gigantic matrix, weighted sums. And depending on the component of each one that I program into, into this, depends on what you get out. It's a very large differential equation. And that's pretty much it. And so here's the decision plan. So this is, the decision plane just means, well, these are basically the minimum thresholds that you see in the three-dimensional plane that tells you whether you're probably positive or probably negative. And that's, that's basically it. That's how it works. So that, I'm kind of a math super nerd, so that's what I think I'm a pretty good demo. But uh, the advantage is right here if you want to take a look. So it comes down to the fact that, you know, we're using nanoamps. Nanoamps. So what is, if we sum these up, all those in the column there, that's less than a thousand nanoamps, right? That's a milliamp. A milliamp, okay? Sorry, microamp. Yeah, a thousand nanoamps to micro. So that's a microamp. What does this mean? The lowest power digital signal processor available is about 10 milliwatts. Milliwatts. So we are more than 100 times more power efficient. And that's the game. So that's, that's where we fit in the marketplace. That's where the product is. You have any digital problem that's dealing with the natural world, we can process it, take care of it in a way that's more power efficient. So we'll open up, up to questions. And if anybody has anything they'd like to break later on, they'll come down here and give it a try. <laughs> so. You just use like neural nets to train? No, no, not at all. No, we use uh, neurobiology. So uh, logarithm, the thing looks like a gigantic logarithm equation solver, like a big matrix of differential equations in a log domain. So the world is not ones and zeros, right? But digital signals, systems of clock are ones and zeros. This is all done in log domain analog. So it looks like a big equation of, you know, e to the weight one, e to the weight two, e to the weight three, all multiplied together. But once it gets to the DSP. Ah, so the event, yeah, what the, the DSP, I don't care how they do that. That's not, that's, you know, that's what becomes then a software problem. People know algorithms. It depends on they can look for different things. So the whole point of this is this this gets you what you this is a starting point for you and then you can take wherever you want to go. So can the DSP wake up fast enough that the glass sound is still happening? Or you have to buffer up the audio. So you can do is you actually just have a so this this DSP actually because we we knew we were looking at this audio domain it actually had uh, can't remember how many k it had it had a low power A to D on the front and. Who basically just keep on buffering that. So they actually the sample and buffer is and it just gets audio right so you can make the elements as much less anything. Okay. So was your competition? And, well, okay. So glass breaks is not actually something that we're that we're selling. We compete with companies like uh, Texas Instruments, uh, National Company, any of the large analog semiconductors. I mean, we're not actually going to sell uh, glass break detectors. There's no real market in there. It's, it's in the audio processing, intensely noise. And so you've got companies like Audience, which was uh, a very well-funded startup out in the area. Biotech over in New Zealand, they make an EMC chip. There's a company called Geotronics, which actually spun out of his lab a few years ago. Uh, basically, any, any of the, the digital signal processing companies 
or that large analog curve. But we're mostly interested in noise cancellation. Uh, this is just an example of one part of our technology working on a chip. So you were doing so, um, the big pro a big problem with hearing aids is background noise, picking out a voice in, uh, and, and, and with all the other noise. Or, uh, but your glass break, I wouldn't really call it noise cancellation, is signal detection. So where's the noise cancellation part? Oh, well, so that, this is just a classifier that it just proves an analog classifier. That's the whole point. Actually, how that works is we don't have that we don't, have that, we don't have that, I didn't bring that demo with It works Tell great, me. that's all I'm going to tell you. It's <laughs> phenomenal. So the problem is with digital signal processors is you're constrained when you put it in somebody's ear, you know, they want it to fit in the ear. And it has to be a little battery and a little DSP. And the problem is it ends up actually being engineering trade-offs. So it's not the algorithms are bad, it's just you can't fit it all in the ear. You need like a car battery on your neck, a computer against the side of your head, and that's just not cool for grandma. Now you guys with iPods, you don't care, you can walk around and have things in your ears. No one asks you hearing aid, but grandma doesn't doesn't jive with that. So uh, what we actually do is a similar thing on the analog weights to determine what is speech and what is not. It looks like a function of all these bandpass filters and the total band energy, and then we determine what's speech and what's not. But it still uses a classifier table. Uh, there's additional, once, once you know what is speech and what isn't, you pass it on to a different, there's different algorithms and different circuits that actually filter out. Uh, filter so you out pass out. some bands? Uh, actually, so this one has two bands. In the, our hearing aid implementation, there's 31 bands. So you pass some bands, and you say the bands at this point are this. This band at this point is speech, and this band at this point is noise. Uh, no, we basically can determine out. We can actually pull out the speech from each of the bands and the noise based off the total integrated energy. Uh, we can talk later. I can okay. show you the trick. Um, I just want to ask real quick, have you guys looked at the fence stuff? Because I know there's a company that did like acoustic signatures and something like this and like it would be really useful in like mobile, you know, we, we, mobile. We've seen a number, yeah, there's some applications we're looking at, particularly like uh, special forces headsets, uh, there's some gunshot I, I, detection and isolation I've seen come up. But I, I think there's some military applications down the road for this definitely. Talking for a second about the business instead of the technology. Yeah. What stage are you guys at? Do you have design wings? What's next? What's next is a prototype of a hearing aid unit, which is due back uh, in the December time frame. At which point we'll then go start going out to uh, the company for design wings. So, that's where we're at. Uh, what's your business model? That was semiconductor company. In the near term, we're evaluating whether or not we're going to be selling chips to OEMs or actually producing the whole unit ourselves. Likely, more than likely, in the beginning, we'll be OEMing chips, and at some point, we may move up to selling partially completed or completed units, depending how how things go. And there's other markets, other hearing aids, cell phone uh, parts, uh, voice, rec voice recognition, and a number of other places we're currently entering in discussions with. Uh, so how much time do we have? Just one more question. Okay, one more question. Uh, and then come talk to us. I think you had your hand up first, so come talk to us after. Um, <clears throat> why aren't other companies doing this? And if they are, what makes you special? Well, there's about 70 people in the world that do it. I have a PhD in device physics, I also biology, and a very small community. And what makes it special is I actually care about power. So everything operates in a region called deep sub-threshold, meaning like for me, a peak amp is a lot of current. That is much, much, much less by about six order of magnitudes compared to what most people can teach. Um, and so what makes a, a special is kind of that. The, the other thing that actually the, the crux of it is I actually have uh, some very nice temperature, robust current sources that make sure things don't move on me as well. That's the other hard part if you actually start talking to industry. And interestingly, my academic career has been solving problems for industry, so I know what those problems are. And it just came, came together as like, I can solve all this. And currently, there's no way I'm going to get an academic position in the environment of the company, and that's where we are today. The other part of the company you don't see here is, is the guy that's is equal in algorithms. We got a guy that came out of Georgia Tech, spent four years doing analog algorithms, and they're very hard to find these guys. We, we do, that's our, their number one limiting factor is being able to add people. Either add people or be able to train them. That's the, the number one problem. Yeah, actually, yeah. So, so I'm actually out of Georgia Tech, and Aaron's out of Michigan. Yeah. So we're actually college buddies, so that's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you. We'll be around after. All right. Thank you guys.